Today is December 14th, 1984. This is Bernice Jackson and Joe Todd, an interview with Mr. Clay Gaines in Woodward, Oklahoma. Mr. Gaines, where were you born? St. Joe, Arkansas. And when's your birthday? October the 1st, 1918. 1918. Who is your father? Team Clifford Gaines. And your mother? Chris Jane Pennington. Pennington. Where were they from? Well, the Gaineses came to Oklahoma from Kansas, and uh, my mother was uh, raised at St. Joe, Arkansas, or Kansas. How come your parents came to Oklahoma? My grandmother and my father and my uncle Slim Gaines came to uh, Beaver County, Oklahoma, the homestead, in 1902. Did your grandmother talk about coming down here, about the trip down? Well, my father talked about the trip coming down. My grandmother died in 1917. What did your father say about the trip? Well, my father said that uh, they drove uh, the covered wagon from Perkins, Oklahoma to Beaver County and drove six head of cattle and a saddle horse and uh, to start proving up their homestead in Beaver County, about two miles south of Slap Out, what is, what is now Slap Out. He said the uh, country was full of game, and uh, turkey, and deer, and quail, and prairie chicken. The grass was knee deep. They were careful to camp along streams to keep them from starting fires. And it was a wide open Indian country. They have trouble fording any rivers. He didn't relate that to me if he did. He, he just uh, was speaking in general about coming out from Perkins to... Uh, did he talk about the Indians much? No, I don't think they were confronted with any Indians at all, except uh, uh, they might have seen, he said they saw a uh, lone Indian rider occasionally on a horse. But, uh, you see, he was talking to me about this probably 1925 or 26, and uh, as best I can recall, he said they had a very uneventful trip as far as the Indians were coming. How long did it take? Oh boy. <laughs> I, I believe he told me it took about 10 days for them to come out across there from, from uh, Perkins. How did they locate the homestead? I've often wondered how the people knew where they were going. Well, of course, the survey had already been in, and they had established, a, a, usually it was a stone pillar that set up a stone pillar on section lines. And it, uh, that's the way they uh, came to their homestead. And I, I believe over street school, there, uh, West Laverne was already established, and there had already been some homesteads uh, occupied in that area. <clears throat> How did your, uh, that, is your grandmother the one that filed on the claim? Yes, my grandmother filed a claim, and my father filed a claim, and Slim was too young to file a claim. He couldn't file a claim. What was your grandmother's name? Annie. Annie. Gaines? Annie. A N N I E Gaines, yes. yes. Well, what was Slim's real name? Chester O. I never did know that. He was always Slim. How did your father and grandmother know that there were homesteads out there available? Well, it was general knowledge, and, and they were trying to get the country settled. And, and when they uh, opened that, I think in '93 was when they opened that Cherokee Strip. And, uh, there was 
they were trying to get people to come in and vote. You know, is Beaver the Cherokee Strip of the past? Well, I think Beaver, I thought Beaver was in the Cherokee Strip, but it might have been in the Panhandle. But uh, it was, uh, they went ahead and opened up the Panhandle. Yeah. That, was the Panhandle an individual homesteading deal over the, when they opened up the whole No, at, uh, when they opened it up, the uh, Panhandle was included. In the, because my parents, uh, my father filed in 1901, but he got his information at the uh, public land office here at Woodbridge. Mm -hmm. They opened the Panhandle at the same time the Cherokee Strip? Yes, they moved in at 93. If you went in before 18 and 90, you were called squatters, yeah. you know, and you could uh, go in and choose your 160 acres and move in there and then when it become available you could go and file on that if somebody didn't beat you sure. where was the land office for that area woodward woodward was the land office mm -hmm. okay. and see all this information i'm giving you is second hand yeah of course mm -hmm. And it's just the best that I can recall from what my father told me about. Well, a lot of cases, that's the only information we have. Um, did your father ever talk about any experiences on the homestead? Anything that stands out? Well, he, he said that, uh, uh, of course, the first thing they did was go in and, and uh, build a, a house to live in, and, and then... Uh, they had taken the cattle with them, and they lived off the land, pretty much off the land, just by hunting the quail and the prairie chicken. And what kind of house did they build? Well, they, originally it was a soddy, and then the, shortly after that, in fact, I think they might have lived, I believe they lived in a tent the first, about the first six or eight months, and then they built a uh, soddy, and then in probably probably 1914-15 they built uh, uh, wooden houses Your parents homesteaded out there, but you were born in Arkansas. Yes, sir. How did? Well, my father got acquainted. Uh, uh, my father went back with uh, Walter and Maud Brown to visit Maud's folks, which was she was my aunt, my mother's sister, and my father went back with them one winter and met my mother and married her and uh, brought her back to. Uh, Oklahoma. After you were born? Yeah. Well, no, we yeah, it came back to Oklahoma before we were born, mm -hmm. before I was born, before Ray and I was born. But my father sold the place, and my father had heard about this Colorado country. So he went to Colorado and bought a half section of land out near what is now Pritchett, Colorado. What year was that? 19 and 19. No, no, I'm sorry, 1917. 1917. Okay. Did he say why he moved to Colorado? Well, he thought it was, it would be a, a bigger opportunity, and he had a quarter here, and he was getting a half section out there, and of course Colorado was just matted with good buffalo grass, and, and the, the soil was good, and so we really went back to uh, I was born in Arkansas, my father, to answer your other question, my father and mother went back to my mother's folks, and my twin brother and I were born at St. Joe, Arkansas. This was after my father bought the place in Colorado, and then in the spring, early spring of uh, 1919, uh, we went to Colorado to occupy that land we bought out there. What are your first memories of Colorado? Well, my first memories of Colorado was the little house we were living in in Springfield, Colorado, waiting for the people to vacate the property that my father had bought out of Pritchett, Colorado. Mm -hmm. It was really Joy Coy at that time. The post office was Joy Coy. 
which was a country store. And we spent that winter in Springfield. And then in the fairly early spring, we went out and occupied the property my father bought. And we lived in a, a half soddy dugout, a dugout that had been dug down probably five feet, then sodded up uh, probably three feet, and then a roof put on it. How old were you when you lived in the dugout? A year and a half old. Okay, do you remember the dugout at all? Yes, I remember the dugout very well. How was the inside decorated? Well, the inside, of course, sparsely. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the inside, uh, it was a pretty fancy dugout. The inside had been plastered up uh, over the dirt part, but uh, then, of course, just it was just boards above the dirt part, but we did have glass windows. And, uh, Where did you get the plaster? Well, uh, they kind of mixed it up themselves. It, was a, it wasn't a cement plaster, it was a kind of a... Uh, dirt plaster, sand and dirt plaster. It might have had a little bit of cement in it, but they would have had to get that out of Springfield, Colorado. Yeah. No, up here they uh, burned gyp rock mm -hmm. and made a plaster out of that yes. in Oklahoma. Yes. Did they have anything like that? We didn't have the gyp rock in, in no. Colorado, in the area where we were in. How big was the dugout? Oh, I'd just be guessing that the dugout was probably 15 by 15 or 16 by 16, and that was the whole building. How many people lived in it? Four of us. Four of us. What kind of furniture did you have in the dugout? Well, we had a cook stove and a heating stove and a table and a bed and some mail kegs. <laughs> what were they used for? Chairs. <laughs> and we, uh, had a set of dominoes, and uh, we played a lot of dominoes in the wintertime when the snow was probably a foot and a half, two foot deep in the winter. Mm -hmm. And what kind of crops did you raise up there? Well, we raised, uh, it, was it was really diversified farming. We raised uh, probably 40 acres of wheat to start with, and uh, uh, 40 acres of broom corn, 40 acres of maize, and we had a garden that would probably cover two acres, and my mother canned everything that we ate during the wintertime out of that garden. Mm -hmm. What chores did you do on the farm? Well, the first time that I really got involved in chores was uh, probably when I was six seven years old, which would have been about 1924, when my father built a new house and we uh, moved out of the dugout and into a new wooden house and uh, uh, we had milk cows and we milked cows and we, we would have to go for fuel during the winter. We would have to, my dad would couple up two wagons and go up to the Cedar Breaks, which was about 25 miles west of us, and we would cut cedars uh, for wood for the both heating and cooking. And uh, my brother and I learned that real early how to use an axe because it was our job every day to make sure that that wood box was full. What are the cedar breaks? Well, the cedar breaks are where is the rough area where you start where you start up in towards the high ridges of the mountains, and they're. Uh, it's just a land covered with cedars. On the chores, did you do any of the plowing of the crops? No. You see, we worked horses then. Uh, my father never owned a tractor. He said horses uh, was a, he thought the tractor would ruin the country. So we did all our farming with horses, and, and he was very proud of his horses. Walk and plow? Yes. How well, many well, acres could you plow in a day with a walk and plow? No. <laughs> I, d I just have to tell you by guess because I followed my dad around a lot when they were he was shaking a walking plow, and uh, I would guess you could probably, if you worked real hard at it, could probably plow five or six acres a day with a walking plow, maybe ten at the most.
most. Mm -hmm. What was the difference in the insulation between the dugout to the wooden house? Well, it wasn't as good, really, because it was all above ground, and the, uh, the uh, you had a kind of a lap siding that you put on. It was, it was a good windbreak, but as, as far as uh, it was a colder home, and it took more to heat it than it did the half dugout because of the warmth of the earth. Hmm. How come there weren't more underground homes then? Well, they were all underground homes up until that time, and then people started building uh, above ground homes. Mm -hmm. They usually had a cellar to store uh, vegetables in, potatoes and apples and things like that, and for to get out of the storm if there was a tornado. Tell me about storms up there. Well, my most vivid recollections of storms is the, is the uh, Tragedy of the Dust Bowl. We went, was, we went to Colorado then? Yes. Which my father laid to the tractors <laughs> instead of the horses. He said that uh, we were trying to farm too easy and too big. And uh, he, had, uh, he uh, yeah. you farmed your land all one way. Instead of listing it, you went in with a one way and it threw it all one way. And uh, he had some pretty good theories about uh, uh, what caused the uh, dust bowl. But the winds out of the southwest was, uh, of course, just summer storms. We got it out of those first times, probably the summer storms and getting you know, out of the summer storms. And occasionally we'd have some hail, but not very often. What about blizzards in the wintertime? Oh, in the wintertime. We, we always had. Uh, it, blizzards would pry, would drift snow up to where we could walk up onto the roof of the house. We could lay a plank from the from the snow bank onto the roof of the house. It wasn't it wasn't unusual at all. And we had hogs, and my brother and I's job was to keep those hogs scooped out so that they didn't smother, regardless of <laughs> what kind of storm we were having. Describe some of those dust storms. What do they look like? Well, the dust storm, of course, we're talking about the real bad dust storms were in the early 30s. That's Janet. She's got a key. She can get in. Uh, the dust storms were in the early 30s, and uh, it was drought, and uh, all this topsoil was laying there bare. They worked the topsoil and, and left no uh, debris on top at all. And the winds were out of the southwest, and you, you could begin to see it build up back south of you, and then pretty quick it would get so dark that you'd have to light the light, and you'd have to light a lamp in the uh, kitchen to, to be able to see. Did, did Black Sunday? Hit you all up there too. Oh, we were back in Oklahoma by then. That was in '34. Yeah. Okay. We were back in Oklahoma. Well, what do you think caused the dust storms? What was the reason for them? Well, it was the uh, poor type of tillage for one thing and drought. When did you move back to Oklahoma? We came back to Oklahoma in 1934. Oh, tell me about the school you went to. You said you well, school. I started first grade in a in a half dugout school, which was two miles from where we lived, <clears throat> and we rode horses to school. And uh, what was the name of the school? Joy Coy School. Hey, still Joy Coy. J O Y C O Y. Two words. Two words. Remember your teacher's name? Yeah. <sighs> No, I remember one of them. My first grade teacher, I'll have to, I hope you don't mind my digressing a little here on this, but my first grade teacher was a fellow named Dudek. And he was a uh, strict disciplinarian. And he, uh, uh, my cousin was the oldest uh, uh, one in school there. And he'd tell her, if you don't 
when I, if I'm not here when nine o'clock comes, you ring that bell and you all come in and start studying. And uh, then he'd come up and uh, look in the window, and if, uh, if everybody wasn't studying, whoever wasn't studying was in trouble. Well, he'd come in and jerk them out of their seat and take them up there on the stage and get them a little blacking. So we, I was scared to death of him, so I always went in and went studying. And the, uh, the uh, culmination of this is he got out of Colorado just ahead of a posse. He had gotten a girl in trouble and took her to a vet for an abortion and she died. <laughs> and uh, he got out of Colorado just ahead of a posse. Then, uh, and then Mrs. Swanner came in and finished the year teaching school. She was a very nice lady to live by a mile from the schoolhouse. And in the second grade, I can't remember the teacher's name, but my mother was always telling me, if you don't behave yourself, I'm going to have Bill Donovan come out and get you and take you to reform school. So <laughs> I was sitting in the front of the class, and we had, in the meantime, they built a board school. And I was sitting up in front of the class, and I heard the, this was the second grade, and I heard the back door open, and I turned around, and there was Bill Donovan in the house. <laughs> Mother finally sent him after me. But he came in and got uh, and uh, got on the stage, and he said, Now, all you children got home, and we'll tell you when to come back to school. So my second grade teacher, he went to Canyon City, Colorado for a year. We're giving hot checks. So if I haven't turned out too good, it was the example. <laughs> <laughs> what year did you start school? Oh, let's see. 20, I guess it'd be 24. Mm -hmm. How big was the half dugout? Oh, I guess the half dugout was probably uh, 18 by 36 or 40. How many pupils? I'm just, I, I just have to guess, but I would say there was probably 25. And did, they, did you have all eighth grades? Yes, we had all eighth grades. Not all, but two high school levels. How did one teacher teach all the grades? Well, it was just a, a matter she would call, uh, say, this is the eighth grade period, and uh, then the eighth grade people would. Uh, take care of the assignments she'd given them, and if it was a first grade period, well, they'd, they'd go over the assignments she'd give them, and she would assign them uh, time at the blackboard to uh, work out problems that she uh, wanted them to work out, and uh, so it, she just divided it up. But you listened to all. I mean, you were, it was all available to you. You'd see the eighth grader working on something, the third grade working on something. That sounded like a pretty good system. Yeah, it isn't it a bad system, it, it system. And did she have a recitation debate? Yes, yes, yes. Just yes. back of her debates and recitations. And, uh -huh. and uh, uh, she also had a, a uh, stool that she'd make you sit in the corner if you uh, <laughs> didn't have your didn't good stool. I don't remember a dunce cap, but she used to make us sit on, over in the corner. But facing the wall, if we uh, had failed to get our uh, assigned lesson. I remember sitting on teacher's desk because I laughed out loud in school. <laughs> <laughs> that was a punishment in those days. When Charlie Clay School was moved to Pritchett in 26, I believe, 1926. And they started, then they built a high school at Pritchett, and we lived a half a mile from Pritchett. How many years did you attend school in Colorado? I attended school for two years till, till two years of high school in Colorado, and then I quit high school and went to work for 50 cents a day after two years of high school. What were you doing for 50 cents a day? I was working on a ranch. Where? Where? Southeast of Pritchett. The people's name was Huff. And as I've said this several times, but Mr. Huff had three of the prettiest little German daughters you ever seen. That us, I'd have been 16, 
But he worked me so hard, I didn't even see those girls. They weren't even there. What'd you do in the ranch? What kind of well, I worked, I worked a team of four head of horses, uh, cultivating row crop, and uh, every farmer then milked and sold uh, cream, you know, separated and sold the skimmings to the pigs and sold the cream. Well, they had a route that picked up cream, took it to the creamery. Why did your family move back to Oklahoma? Well, uh, I think it was probably my mother came back to Beaver, and as I remember, my father, in, 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 for about six months, to be. She was doctoring for some sort of ailment she had, and my father and my older brother and I stayed in Colorado for about six months then while my dad was selling the property, and we sold the property, and then we all came back, you know, and the rest of us came back. And what year was that? Uh, 34. Did you want to come back to Oklahoma, or do you want to stay up there? I was ready to get out of Colorado because it was just destitute. Colorado was just destitute. There was no work in Colorado. And I came back to Oklahoma and right off I got a job working on a fur rancher. And, um, okay, did your job with Mr. Huff play out then? No, my job with Mr. Huff didn't play out. I left because I thought he was going to work me to death. <laughs> I worked for him for about a month and I decided I can't survive this very much longer, so I I quit. And that was about the time. It was getting close to the time that we were coming back to Oklahoma. Okay. And who did you begin to work for when you came back here? First person, I think. The first winter that I was here, I think I worked for Levy Pruitt, who was, I don't, know, don't remember if he was a county commissioner at that time or not, but uh, he, he was either a county commissioner or became a county commissioner shortly after that. And I worked for Levy uh, probably the, that winter, and then the, I went to work on the T Bar T ranch house, ranch west of Beaver, seven or eight miles west of Beaver. And I worked off and on for the T Bar T, mostly steady for about three years. Where did your family settle when they came back? In Beaver, in the town of Beaver. In the town of Beaver. How big was Beaver at that time? 1,800 probably, 1,500. You think it would be that many? 1,200? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just guessing. That was in 34. Yeah, 30, well, this would have been you know, 35, 36, somewhere on there. Well, there were a lot of people, you know, hadn't there? Yeah, yeah. Were there many people who went to California at that time? Oh, there was an awful lot of people who went to California. In fact, I went to California and worked one summer. In between all of this time I was working off and on in these ranches, I went to California and cut grapes out in the San Joaquin Valley when Steinbeck was riding grapes of wrath. What? How come you went to California? Uh, the Browns that had lived next to us in Colorado had moved to California, and I went out there with the, to visit them and worked uh, a summer out there. Were you one of the migrant workers out there? Then? No, I wasn't really a migrant worker. I lived with my aunt's family. The migrant workers were uh, different, and, and the Browns already had established themselves, and, and we cut grapes for people that they'd been cutting grapes for and, and picked up melons. And, uh, you know, would you consider yourself and the Browns the Okies in California? Well, the Browns went out there in... Uh, early 20s, so they were out there before. The Okies is what they considered, and, yeah. and uh, uh, I wouldn't consider myself as an Okie because... Of, I guess the Okies left in, what, late 20s, early 30s? Uh, early, early 30s. Early 30s, early 30s yeah. Mm -hmm. 31, 32, 33. Okay, when did you go to California? Well, 36, 36. Was, was the... 36 or 37 was the first year I went to California. Could you describe the Okies 
how they managed in California? Well, of course, like I said, I didn't live in any of those migrant camps. Uh, so I, I don't I don't have first hand knowledge really about um, how the migrant did your migrant work. Did your aunt tell you anything about them? Or? No, and we didn't run into them that much. You know, uh, we worked. Uh, they had work. We worked for in Hay. We had a job with a, a Portuguese fellow that had to raise a lot of hay. So we worked in the hay. And then when we weren't working in the hay, there was a Japanese fellow that they had worked for before that had a lot of melons and fruit and so we worked for him and then the, it was just mm -hmm. people that they had already established a working relationship with i, I didn't go out and, and uh, pick lettuce and, and things like the right. migrant of okies did where did the browns live at fresno fresno or kingsburg really okay. about 20 miles south of fresno mm -hmm. why does the word okie have a bad connotation well, the word Okie has bad connotation because uh, so many of those people that got out there barely had enough money to get there, and uh, they had to, and uh, they had uh, a very tough time of it. Of course, the local people in California hated to see them come because they would work so cheap, and So I guess that movie, The, the Grapes of Wrath, like you said, the pickup truck with the mattress on top was pretty true then. Yes, we saw them all along the road. Has anyone ever estimated how many people went to California from Oklahoma, or from this area, Oklahoma, Kansas, Colorado? No, I don't think anyone's ever estimated. Someone may have. I, I'm not aware that it's ever yeah. been estimated, but there was a tremendous amount of people. Mm -hmm. Another thing you couldn't believe about California was the Union Pacific ran right through up through Kingsburg. So every every freight train that went north, the whole top of it would be covered with people sitting on top of it, riding train, riding freight train. And then the next one that went south, it'd be the same way. The whole top of it was covered with migrants going back and forth riding the uh, Pitching a ride on the freight train. So they were just working in the fields? Well, they either worked in the fields or uh, whatever they could find. Like whatever that. they could find. If they heard that uh, the Imperial Valley is another high productive area in California, the San, uh, uh, San Luis Valley, San Luis San Luis. It's a big valley in there. San Fernando? I've heard, of, I've heard of Napa Valley, San Fernando Valley, and but the southern, the a lot of the lettuce stuff was down closer to the border, and, and some of the produce was raised closer to the border, and that's probably why you would see migrants going back and forth so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when when did you come back to Oklahoma from California? Came back to Oklahoma from California in the spring of '38. Did you like it out there in California? Yes, it was pretty, pretty, very pretty place. Mm -hmm. Tell me about Black Sunday. Well, Black Sunday, we were living in Beaver. Black Sunday, and uh, uh, I'd come in. Uh, I'd been working out on this T bar T ray. Mm -hmm. Hauling cake or something, and unloading carload of cake, and came back in, and this huge cloud began to appear from the north. And of course, it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and uh, pretty quick, uh, it just uh, the air was just full of dust. It was just even difficult to breathe, and the uh, people put. Uh, wet claws and put over the windows, you know, to, uh, but the house was getting full of dust and uh, it was, yeah, very dark and it, of course, was the worst dust storm I'd ever seen. I've seen some pretty good ones in Colorado, but that was the big one. How come that was such a bad dust storm? Well, there, uh, uh, 
it was in the fall when we were getting some northern winds, as I remember. Early fall, we were getting some winds out of the north, and of course we had a strong wind out of the north, and all of that area of Kansas that was sweet country, it was in a drought, too, and it just picked up more dust and more dirt than normally would happen, and carried it on across Oklahoma and Texas. That'd be my opinion of why it was. You know, you said that was in the fall? Or was Black Sunday in the fall? Uh, I was early. I thought it was early fall. I don't remember. Was it spring? Mm -hmm. uh, it was spring. It was April the 14th. Yeah, that's right. It was April. Well, we were sure getting off one. Normally, we didn't get that much strong wind out of north that early. I guess it's still a winter storm. That was unusual time. Yeah. Okay, what were you doing with that dust ball hit? Well, I'd just come in from unloading cake off of a flat off of a freight car. How did you breathe in those dust storms? Best you could. They, like I said, uh, my mother had already uh, wet uh, what, what they call dish towels and put them over the windows, uh, so to keep as much of it as she could out of the house. What did the women do with the babies? Well, that's all they could do was just there wasn't anything special you could do yeah. about it. Uh, you could put just something in the crib. Of course, we didn't have any young children, so I don't know uh, how that would have been handled, but I would guess they'd put something in the crib. When you came back in 38, what did you do? Went back to working on the ranches. Back to the same ranch? Well, I worked on that same ranch some, and uh, usually the McFarland's was always needing some help. That was a ranch close to it. And, uh, we worked. We helped them work cattle, just wherever there was work. Who owned the the QRT? Well, it was uh, it's the old John George Ranch, and it uh, was owned by. He had three daughters and a son, and it was owned by them. And the one that married to Tom Blakemore, who started Ideal Food Stores, ended up with it, and his boys ended up with it. But it's been sold two or three times since then. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure how it's about. Um, did you have any thoughts on the situation in Europe in those days, 38, 37, what was going on over there? Well, these people I worked for sold the ranch and I went with them to Denver for a while. The daughter and her husband that was operating the ranch and uh, that was in uh, late 38, early 39, and the uh, Spanish Civil War was going on, and uh, they were recruiting uh, people out of, uh, they were recruiting Americans that wanted to go and fight in the Spanish Civil War, but I never was that concerned about Europe. Now, was this in Denver where they were doing the recruiting? Yes, yes. Who hmm. was? Doing the recruiting? I don't know. They're just there'd be an ad in the paper saying, uh, "Would like to go and serve in the Spanish Civil War?" On the side of the Spanish, I guess. <laughs> well, well, I think, against the Germans, I suppose. Well, it would have probably been on the loyalists because the Germans and the Italians were. They had elected a government in Spain, and the Germans and the Italians were trying out there. Uh, Franco was trying to overthrow the elected government and he was using Italian planes and German planes. And yeah. That's about the only thought I had about Europe until then. Then the next thought I had about Europe was I was dancing with the draft board secretary one Saturday night up at Beaver and she told me that if I had any preference about where I would like to be in the service, what branch I would like to be in the service, that I probably ought to get in it. She said, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but I'll just tell you that if you, if you have any preference. So that was Saturday night. Sunday I went to Oklahoma City, and Monday I joined the Air Force. When was that? Uh, September the 1st, I think, of 1941. Who was the guy? Pauline Hickel. 
You know Pauline? Mm-hmm. Yes, I know Pauline. I believe it's Pauline Hinkle. Mm-hmm. Either her or Irish Bridgewater. I, I believe it's Pauline Hinkle who told me. Mm-hmm. I believe she was Secretary of the Air Force. Yes, I think she was. So you joined the Army Air Corps? That's right. Where'd you take basic? At Shepherd Field, Wichita Falls. Was that very rough basic for the Army Air Corps? Oh, no, not really. The physical was rough, but the, the attitude of the Air Force was different than our training cadres, of course, that they brought in from you know, infantry to train us to march. And, but as soon as we got through basic training and got into a school, uh, the attitude was completely different. It was, they wanted you to learn instead of train. What school did you go into after basic? Well, after basic, I went into the Air Mac School, Air Mechanic School there. There at Shepherd Field? At Shepherd Field, graduated from it in March of uh, 1942 and was shipped to uh, Salt Lake City, then on out to Wendover, where they began forming the 8th Air Force. Pearl Harbor, what were you doing? Pearl Harbor, I was in a, in a, in a picture show uh, at uh, Wichita Falls, and we came out into the uh, uh, front of the theater, and they had a radio on and was talking about Pearl Harbor being bombed. And at that time, we had about 2,000 men on Shepherd Field, maybe 2,500. But by the time I left there, there was 50,000 men in training there. What did you do in Salt Lake City? Uh, I supplied engineer to begin with. And, uh, what does a flight engineer do? Well, a flight engineer is uh, uh, he rides with the pilot and the co pilot and the navigator, and he watches the instruments and the gas and uh, takes care of the maintenance of the ship uh, when it's on the ground. And kind of like a crew chief? It's like a crew chief, uh, it, particularly if, it, if you're away from your home base. If you're at home base, your crew chief's there, but if you're on detached service by the flight engineer, he takes care of that. But mostly he stands there and watches the instruments. And the, what aircraft did you work on? The B8, uh, B-18s to start with. What's a B-18? <laughs> I, I thought you'd probably ask that. <laughs> Well, the B-18 was a Douglas bomber. It was kind of like a DC-3 with a big undercarriage that would carry bombs. It was a two-engine bomber. And we did sub patrol uh, off of the, uh, out of Goleta Field, which is a Marine base. We fly from what is now Edwards Air Force Base. We, when we went on sub patrol, it moved us to Muroc Air, uh, Muroc. Dry Lake, which is Edwards Air Force Base, and then we would fly over to the coast, and they would send us. They would say either go up the coast uh, 150 miles, or fly up the coast for an hour, and, and then come back into Goleta, and, or fly south to, towards San Diego. We were just sub patrolling out there. They had sighted. They felt that the Japanese was going to uh, make some effort to. Uh, Either shell the United States, the West Coast, and it was long about that time they decided to submarine out there. So we're I understand they did make one attack down by Los Angeles or something. San Diego, some, I think. Get some oil tanks, or yeah, somewhere in that area. So they made one attack, but that was uh, the, the, we were waiting, really waiting for them to get enough 17s. So we were doing sub patrol and B-18s, waiting for them to get enough 17s to form the 306 bomb group. Which is the group I served in during World War II. Okay, from uh, Salt Lake City, where did you go? Salt Lake City, of course, we went to Westover Field. Oh, I'm sorry. You mean from Wendover Air Base? Yeah, wh- where is Wendover? It's 120 miles west of Salt Lake City, okay. right out on that dry lake. We went from there to Westover Air Base and did sub patrol up there waiting. Now, where's that located? That's about 90 miles west of Boston, Holyoke, okay. Massachusetts. But we had our 17s, and we got in our 17s, and we were in 17s, and we were flying along the East Coast there on some sub patrol. Now you say the B-18 had an undercarriage that carried well, bombs? No, it just had a it had a bomb bay, but it was a I say it was an old 
DC-3, you know, the Douglas passenger that they just made a little bigger down there. So it was a passenger airplane that they converted to a wartime? Yeah. Well, they really made it that way in the factory. They hadn't converted it in, in wartime with it. We, we were just waiting until we could get enough B-17s to form the group. And then when we get the group formed, why they send us to the East Coast and we did some stuff at Pearl Island. And what was the name of the group? The number? 306th Bomb Group. 306th Bomb Group. Petty, yeah. You know, okay. it's just How group. many planes were in a group? 48 planes. 48. Four squadrons, 12 planes per squadron. And how many men on a crew would be 17? About, well, they changed it some, but six usually. Pilot, co pilot, and the top gunner, ball turret gunner, waist gunner, and tail gunner. And what was your position? I was an engineering. I, uh, I never flew a combat mission period. I was an engineering from the time we got over there until I came home. Now you say you're an engineering. That's not flight engineering, is it? No, that's where uh, you have a, a, a line chief, they call him. You have an engineering officer, and then you have a line chief. And I was a master sergeant, and I served under a, a major sorry as his line chief, and it was up to me to keep those 12 planes flying. So you were on the ground? Then? Yes, I was on the ground. So? Had a real easy okay. war. Charge of, in charge of maintenance then? Yes, okay. charge okay. of maintenance in a bomber squad. Okay, when did they first organize the Eighth Air Force? April 1942. March or April, right along there. Okay. Uh, since I was in the Army, would an Air Force be the equivalent of a division or a group? which was four squadrons, three and six bomb group, would be probably the equivalent of a division. It would be in the neighborhood of uh, engineering personnel and flight personnel, probably 15,000, 14, 15,000 personnel. Okay, how many airplanes total in the 306 bomb group? 48. 48 total? Yeah, four group, four, four squadrons. Okay, and so would the Air Force, the 8th Air Force, then be the equivalent of like 1st Army or 2nd Army? Well, I don't know how many men got to be in those armies, uh, but the 8th Air Force had, uh, they reached the point where they could put up uh, 2,400 planes. Yeah. So that would take a lot of first men. I'd say it'd be about the same then. Um, now, was the 306 organized as part of the 8th Air Force? Yes. Okay. Was it, it was the first bomb group overseas. Okay. We went overseas in uh, September the 1st of 1942. The 306 bomb group was the first bomb group overseas and the first bomb group over here. Okay, and you left Massachusetts? Yes. And you went where? Well, the flight crews left Massachusetts and flew to England, and the ground crews came to Fort Dix and went across on the QE-1. What's the QE? Oh, the Queen, Queen Elizabeth No. 1, biggest boat. Did you go across on the... Yes. Tell me about that trip. Well, it was the trip. They had uh, a division of artillery, which was 18,000, and uh, probably 10,000 close to 10,000 Air Force on a luxury ship that was built to take care of about 600 people. So they were moving an awful lot of people. And we had we had uh, two meals a day, three, twice a day. And uh, those luxury cabins that the uh, couple would be in probably had 10, 12, uh, people sleeping in them at a time, and they slept in eight-hour shifts. You slept eight hours, and then you would have to get out and let someone else sleep for eight hours. Well, how many, if they were made for two people, how did you sleep? Well, they, 
They put hammocks along the side, three three high, and uh, cots. And mm -hmm. where'd you take your meals? Well, I had a, they had a huge mess hall. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge ship, of course, and they had a big mess hall. What'd your meals consist of on the ship? An awful lot of mutton. It was a British ship, so we ate quite a bit of sheep. <laughs> going over. It took us five days to cross. Mm -hmm. I understand that someone told me that that was one of the big targets of the German Navy for the QE-1. Well, I'm sure it probably was, but the, the QE-1 traveled at probably 45 knots at, at, at full speed. And, and uh, during the daytime, they would zig it and zag it. It took so long for a submarine to get, you know, lined up on it, so they would zigzag it. Then at night, it was just a street to you could look back at the wake and you could see it was going straight, but in the daytime we were zigzagging back. We didn't have any escort. Yeah. We had a we had a plane escort the first day, but then after we got into the Irish Sea, we went up through the Irish Sea and into the Firth of Clyde, which is up near Glasgow, and we unloaded at Glasgow. When did you rejoin the rest of the the flight crew? Well, they, they put us on trains the next day and, and sent us to the air base where we were going to be. Mm -hmm. And we lived in tents for about, oh, six weeks while they were finishing up the barracks. But they didn't have the air field quite done, so we really didn't get our planes. For, we didn't get our planes for probably three weeks after we got over there. Now, what then part of England were you in? Bedford. It's in the Midlands, yeah, near right. Bedford. Okay. How far from London? 90 miles, about 90 miles north of London. Okay. Had the Battle of Britain already been fought by this time? Oh yeah, the Battle of Britain had already been fought. And the Germans were still bombing London. They had, uh, they were bombing it uh, not only with uh, fighter bombers, but they were bombing it. Well, it was, it was mostly fighter bombers. But then, in, in during the three years I was over there, towards the end of the three years I was over there, they were using the V1 and the V2, which is a, a rocket. Yeah. A, a rocket and a self-propelled uh, bomb. Did they ever bomb your area? No, sir. 20 miles, about 20 miles, which is close. They hit a tank factory about 20 miles from us, but they never ever bombed there again. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that was your base of operations there at Bedford? Yes, sir. Okay. When you said that you were the first uh, bomb group over Germany? Yes. Okay. When did you begin bombing? You know, I, I loaned my book to Mr. to Brigadier General or to General Judy. I don't know. Uh, I would say it was late September or early November of forty-two. Two, probably November of forty-two. We made our first sorties over Germany, and it was probably the sub pins in France. Now, what were your duties on the ground? Our duties on the ground was to have a plane ready to fly, loaded with bombs, and as soon as it got back, it was to go over it and, and uh, see if, it, if we could fly it the next day. If we could, then we'd get it ready to fly the next day. What is the bomb load of the B-17? Oh, I, I just have to guess at it. We had a little, it was a separate branch, armament was a separate branch, but I would guess that uh, six to eight thousand pounds bomb. Probably, most of it was probably six, twelve, five hundred pound bomb. Mm -hmm. What was your, how many planes did you lose? Did you lose? Oh, well, we only had one crew finished up 25 missions. We went on one. We went on one raid, we sent out 12 planes and got three back, so we were losing a lot of planes. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, would they, hmm, were most of them either killed or taken prisoners then? There was a lot of them uh, taken prisoners, uh, and uh, most of them were taken prisoners, I'll put it that way. Once in a while, they would uh, a German uh, fighter would uh, get a direct hit enough to blow the ship up. But uh, usually, the crew had a chance to get out. And if they detected it early, they'd bail out. And, uh, mm -hmm. um, what 
was your hem what I'm having to be your percentage of turnovers? Well I told you about the turnover's not a good word. <laughs> your death rate. Well our death rate our loss rate, if you're yeah, trying to figure rate. out what our loss rate yeah. was, was uh, it depended on the uh, some some raids we would go on, and like the one I told you about, we went on and we only had three ships to fly the next day out of the 12 we sent out of our squadron. And our loss rate was very heavy at times, depending upon, you know, like Swineford, which was a big ball bearing factory. When they went in Swineford, the Germans moved everything in there that they could. Fighters, they'd start, we, they, just as soon as they could get find out which direction we were headed. Well, of course, then they'd concentrate all of their fighters and all their ACAC in there where they could give us a hard time. So our, our death, our loss rate was, it varied. Sometimes we'd lose two ships and sometimes we'd lose, like the one time we lost nine. They said he had three that flew the next day. Now only three got back or three could fly the next Only day. three got back. Okay. Only three landed. The rest of them were shot down over France. You know Kenneth Beckwith? Beckwith, the name rings a bell, but I can't place him. He was a, uh, he was on B twenty fours, and he was shot down over France. Oh, he was shot down over he France. He lived out at the uh, Balco. Oh yes. Yeah. See, the twenty fours were most of the twenty fours were along the east coast. They were a little further east from us. We were in the Midlands, and, and most of the twenty fours were eighty, ninety miles east of us. Yeah, a bunch, big bunch yeah. of airfields over there along the North Sea. Yeah, we interviewed him and he shot was shot down here the last mission. Is that right? First mission. Did he say where he was in prison? Yeah. yeah. You need to um it was up by the Baltic Sea. He, oh, he, was, they a had 11, hmm? he was probably at Bar. Yeah, he called it by name and he said they had eleven thousand airmen in the prison camp. I I I I can relate with him. I'll tell you, uh, the war ended on the 8th, and on the 12th, we had jerked all of the armaments out of all the 17s on our base. Mm -hmm. And the Russians had already moved up past Barth, didn't they? They were up uh, the river up there, I forgot which one it was. But we asked uh, the pilot uh, if I could fly as engineer, and he said, sure. And uh, I flew as engineer on a flight that we flew into Barth, Germany, and picked up those prisoners of war and flew them back to Paris so they'd catch right home. It was, he was, uh, we just had a 10 mile corridor that, that we could fly in, and they, the pilot said they briefed me and told me to stay in a 10 mile corridor because uh, the, the rush, all the rest of this is Russian territory. They had already come through. A, a Colonel Zimp kid had staged a breakout just off this prisoner of war camp. Or this airman's camp, and they uh, had taken charge of Bar. But the Russian, a Russian infantry division, and a bunch of artillery came through, and they told him, Mr. Zinke, if you get back over there in that prison camp, this is Russian, this is going to be Russian occupied territory, and they moved back in the camp. And that was probably a week before we got to go and pick them up. But uh, I was, I'm probably the only man in Woodward that. They've been behind the Russian lines, but behind the Russian lines for a little while. Tell me, um, so I guess most of your experience in the war was just on the ground there. Ground, the right. Planes the exception of that one trip over over to pick up those prisoners of war, I was never over Europe. Yeah, tell me about about that trip. Well, of course, we flew over the Zyder Sea, which had been all you could see of the houses was the red rooftops and some tree rows, the tops of tree rows. Northern Germany, we had bombed it very heavily. You'd fly over a town the size of Woodward, and all you could see would be where streets had been and a few plumbing pipes sticking up. And uh, there was an awful lot of devastation in that area. And that harbor we flew over, and I don't remember the name of it, it was full of sunken ships. There were a lot of civilians killed. Yes, there was lots of civilians killed. More than we admitted to, probably. Okay, the, um, when did you make this flight into East Germany? Uh, 12th day of uh, May, I think. That was 45? 45, yeah. And what exactly, where did you, did you leave from England? We left from England and we flew uh, directly there. Of course, we didn't even have to refuel. We left and flew directly there. 
the Russians had it organized. They had uh, 29 prisoners here, and then they'd have a space of probably 60 feet or 70 feet where we could park another 17, and they had 29 prisoners there, and they had that all the way around that ramp. We didn't cut our engines off. We just throttled back and loaded up 29 prisoners, taxied out, and took off, and flew back. So you'd have 29 people on, on yes, the Yes, we had 29 plus security. Yeah. How many men were in that prison camp that long? Well, I'd heard there was around 14,000, 15,000, but I don't know. I don't have any way of knowing. And how wide did you say the quarter was you were flying? in? 10 miles. 10 miles. 10 miles trip. How far into East Germany is that area? Well, that's a long ways into East Germany. It's probably, I, I'm just be guessing if I did it out in Texas, but I would guess 300, probably 350 miles. Mm -hmm. At least 300 miles, I'd say probably. How long did it take you to get all the prisoners out? Well, I don't know, because uh, there was a, a just a constant stream. There's just, after our group got out of there, there was no group waiting to get in there. So, so uh, we only made the one trip, and the uh, 50 ships, we might have could have hauled them all, but I doubt if we hauled them all, but we got in and out of there fast. And what, was it a one day period, a two day period that you got them all out? Yeah, one day period, one day. we got them all out in one day yeah. period. Were they all Americans or were they different? They were all Americans. All Americans. There was a big French concentration camp joined that officer's camp there. Mm -hmm. We flew right over it. And, uh, it was really barbed wire and heavy. Now was it like when it was it a death camp or? I don't know. I suppose it's just a, a prisoner war camp. Prisoner war camp. Ever visit any of the uh, death camps? No. no. What did you do on VE Day? Well, VE Day. Uh, you're talking about when the Japanese surrendered? No, when Germany surrendered. Oh, well, when Germany surrendered. Yeah. Uh, it was pretty civil at our place. We didn't have much celebration. Some of the fellows went down and had a few beers, but uh, uh, I was at a debarkation port, uh, VJ Day. <laughs> I stayed in the barracks because I, they, oh man, they had a. Okay, tell me about VJ Day again. What well, VJ Day, I was in, in the barracks at. At Stone Air Base, waiting for a ship to come home, which is Stone is, is right near uh, Liverpool, probably eight ten miles east of Liverpool. And I uh, woke up in the middle of the night, and uh, the street was full of people, and they'd taken up all the picket fences, and had a big bonfire going, and they accidentally got a, a British bus stop on fire and they had quite a celebration there VJ Day. I, I, after I woke up and seen what was going on, I flipped on the radio and they were talking about the Japanese surrender and that's when I first knew the Japanese surrender. What did you do during uh, D-Day Normandy? D-Day in Normandy, we, we started real early. We had uh, we had bombed up with anti-personnel bombs, if I remember right. Had all our ships loaded with anti-personnel bombs. And uh, we got off a real early flight, and they flew over there and dumped, and they came back, and we loaded up again. And they flew another mission. They flew three missions that day over uh, North France, where, where the... Uh, how many missions did you normally fly in one day? One. One. Yeah. So that was that busy was a day short right? mission, but uh, to just they didn't have to go very far in. They were, yeah. But they they some of them were you know bombing railroads and bombing railroads where they thought the Germans would be trying to bring up replacements and so uh, I don't know if the whole Eighth Air Force flew three missions that day or not, but the, our bomb squadron did. But the Battle of the Bulge, was there an increase during that period? Well, uh, the Battle of the Bulge came on what, right at Christmas? It was Christmas of 44. Yeah, and and we had real bad weather, and the, and the all of the 8th Air Force was, as far as I know, was grounded for about three days there. 
then it cleared up, and then we started uh, just bombing the hell out of them. When did you get your discharge? September the 13th, 1945 at Camp Chaffee. You had no thought of making that your career? Of being a... Well, no, I left out one important thing back there. I got married in 1942. Where did you meet your wife? I met her at Freedom before the war, before I got into the war, and got married in 1942, and uh, I'd had, I'd had all the service I wanted. And, uh, mm -hmm. What's your wife's name? Thelma. Thelma? Thelma. T-T-L-M-A. And what's, what's her maiden name? Daughter. Her father was a rancher out here at Freedom. So I was glad to get out and... Uh, Anything happened the trip back over from Europe? Yeah, we did. We got into... Uh, I caught a Liberty ship out of uh, Liverpool and you couldn't believe Liverpool Harbor. It was just full of sunken ships. They just had to kind of... They just kind of had to pick their way out through sunken ships because the Germans had sunk a lot of ships in Liverpool on a Liberty ship. Now the QE2s, the QE1 was uh, 1,084 feet long, and a Liberty ship is about 275 feet. And we got into a storm the second, third day out. Well, the first place, as we came out, a landmine had broken loose and was floating out in the Irish Sea as we came out of the Irish Sea into the. Uh, Atlantic, and uh, we were probably 100 yards from it. But then, third and fourth day, I believe it was, we got into a storm that uh, that small ship, those swells were 50, 40, 50 feet high. You go one of those swells, the prop would come up and, and uh, out of the water, and they had to just slow it down. It just we just kind of wallered for two days. I thought, my God, three years of war, and we're going to have to swim. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we had change uh, of pace. Took us thirteen days to come back across. It took us five days to cross. Came into Boston, and you've never seen the sort of reception we got. Tell me about that. Well, as we came in, there was two barges with bands on it that came out and met us. Every ship and every liner, every freighter and every liner in the harbor had their whistles going. And uh, the water hose was going, you know. And uh, that was just about it. And, and they uh, took us out to Camp Miles Townish and... Uh, that is quite a meal, and the next day was on the train for Chaffee. Did everybody come to Chaffee? That no, not everybody. They they sent dependent upon where you were from. Yeah. You know, they sent you back to an area mm -hmm. that's close to. Where is Chaffee? Fort Smith, Arkansas. Fort Smith, yeah. <clears throat> that's where I used to go to summer camp for National Guard. After your discharge, what well, after you? discharge, I, I worked for the government at uh, Tinker Field for six months, and then we came up, and my wife and I uh, moved on to the ranch, and I was sitting out there one morning, and her face was real long, and she said, I said, what's the matter? And she said, I never thought you'd ever bring me back to this place. <laughs> she hated it. So I just changed clothes and came down and got a job. And I've been in business and Woodward ever since. What did you do at Tinker? I was an engine build up. That's where, that's where they had the fire over there. That's where uh, an engine came in and, and uh, it, we tore it down and re redone it. And 
regular seminar and things. Just what made you decide to quit and come back to the ranch? Well, it was, uh, I can't stand and just do one thing and end up shut up in a building and you, all you do is just stand there and do one, pull a lever and put this one in and pull a lever and it was too monotonous really. I just couldn't stand it. It was too much like what I've been doing. And how long were you on the ranch before you came to Woodward? Oh, don't seem like very long. I don't know. Maybe six months. Yeah. And then uh, uh, maybe a year at the most, six months. I and guess. you came into Woodward, what kind of job did you get? I went to work for Hackett Auto Supply and worked for them for nine years. And ended up managing it and worked for them for nine years. Did your wife work at that time? No, we had two children, and she worked. She did. Yeah, she worked, <laughs> didn't she? We had two girls at that time, and uh, then I, uh, our son was born, and I went to work for, uh, during that time I was working at Packard, he was born, and I went to work for Firestone Pine River Company, worked for him for three years. And quit and came back up here and got into, to make a long story short, another fellow and I bought Western Finance and uh, we operated it for a couple of years and built it up and a loan company come along and wanted to buy it and we sold it out. We also had started real estate in Western Finance. Mm -hmm. Then I just got out on loan in the real estate business and I've been in the real estate business since 19... 62, I think. Yeah. It's been very good. I just, it wasn't a matter of brilliance. It was just a matter of being lucky. I had established myself in the real estate business, and I've got uh, a lady in there that's uh, just a terrific salesman. And uh, we were in it when Woodward started growing from... Uh, 5,000 to 15,000, and we were the most active people in the real estate business, and it's been very good. And I bought another small ranch, and my son lives on it. And I made the greatest folly of all a while back. I bought a couple of thoroughbred mares, and I've got two thoroughbred colts out there. <laughs> See, you weren't living here at the tornado, the time of the tornado. Okay. Well, we were living on the ranch at the time of the tornado, but my wife and our oldest daughter were at my mother-in-law's house, and it was torn down all around them. And it's where the wagon bag sits. It was the old Clark house. There was a big high gable house there. Mm -hmm. I that house. And uh, they lived there, and, and my father-in-law and I were in Oklahoma City trying to buy him a car. And uh, that was a devastating time for Woodward. That was... Uh, mm -hmm. What did, when you came back, what did Woodward look like? Well, Woodward is a, was, has always been a friendly, nice country town, and it's always had a pretty good livestock market and mm -hmm. progressive people. I understand there was a telephone strike during that tornado. Yes, there were. There were, but uh, uh, as soon as the tornado hit, uh, all of the... Uh, or a lot of the people went back to work and, and got the phone lines back in. Which part of Woodward was destroyed? <clears throat> well, the worst part of Woodward, the, the, for the heaviest, heaviest death toll, was along the west side and the north side. Uh, I think out there where we live. <laughs> where do you live? We live on 27th Street. How far south on 27th? Uh, two blocks off of Oklahoma. North? South. South. Yeah, that was, there wasn't much building in there right then, was there? No, but it, it, it tore, tore everything there, out right. across there. And, and on north across from where you live was, oh uh, boy, it looked like, I'd, like I said, I'd flown across some of those cities that had been bombed over there, and the northwest side of Woodward looked like it had been bombed. How many people were killed here at Woodward? Oh, 109 or 100. There's over 100 a few, but I And there's one or two that they've they don't know. They, 
not to the cat pond and I think there was a hundred they claimed a hundred and nine people killed. But your house that your wife was in wasn't hurt? Well, yeah, I took the roof off from it, uh, and uh, it was full of bricks because of those high gables. Mm -hmm. But they uh, rebuilt it and, and lived in it uh, for several years, and then uh, my wife's mother passed away, and uh, my father-in-law sold the house, mm -hmm. bought another one. Well, they were lucky, weren't they? Yes, they were real lucky. Very lucky. Well, do you have any questions? Um, I wanted to go back to the uh, WPA day and the CC oh, when we yes. were in, when our country was in such an economical. Yes. Um, in between working on ranches, I I probably spent three six months. I think it was the six month. Sign up. You sign up for six months, and I, I, I imagine uh, in that time that I was on and off the of ranches, uh, I spent uh, 18 months in CC camps. Whereabouts mm -hmm. were you? Still? Well, I was at Gillette, Wyoming, trying to put out a coal fire, and then I was in Southern Colorado at Dolores, Colorado, which is was a beautiful country. Gillette, Wyoming is desolate, you know. Mm -hmm. Sage hens, sagebrush, oh, <laughs> and then uh, uh, I spent a term at Buffalo. Oh, you did. I think six months at Buffalo, mm -hmm. and uh, we built, set out tree rows. I thought that was one of the good, the best programs that the uh, government ever had. Tree rows and. Erosion dams, terracing, and terrace, more farmers field. Did you work out on the Adobe Spring area? Yeah, well, I worked out there uh, in the Adobe Spring area. We set out a lot of tree rows in, in the Adobe Spring area, and we also, I've forgotten the rancher's name, we also built a concrete, a small concrete dam across Buffalo Creek down there west of Buffalo. Mm -hmm. But we run a lot of terrace lines in the Dover Springs area, and we ran, built a lot of, uh, of uh, tree rows, sat a lot of tree rows uh, north and west of Buffalo. And I bet they're still up there. I, every time I go by, one of those tree well, rows. We saw, we saw some the other day the CC boys had set out. Yeah. It was still. an awful awesome good program. I, I was very fond of that program. How were those camps organized? Well, they were organized under the military, and I suppose they might have been, maybe they had some foresight because we had a, a captain rank from, from Gage over here. He's colonel, he's retired colonel. Now, he was our commanding officer at Buffalo, the last one I was in. And, uh, he was set up on a, on a military line. We had barracks that we slept in, and each uh, uh, we had a mess hall that we had. That we well, wasn't used. that necessary? Yes, that's the only way you could have organized it that way. And then we had uh, the forest department had uh, supervisory personnel down there uh, helping us or showing us how to set the trees out and how to build dams. And, and uh, uh, like I say, I think it was the best one we ever had. What's this uh, man's name at the retired colonel now? Rank. Where does he live? <clears throat> he lives in Oklahoma City now. He has, still has a small ranch out here by Gage. What's his first name? Oh, I can't tell you. Colonel Bill. Bill mm -hmm. Bill Ranch. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to talk to him. We don't have anyone that was in charge of the CCC camp. Oh. Well, he'd be glad to talk to you. Yeah. I get a letter from him every once in a while. Oh, you do. He calls me one of his boys. I served a, a well, what was before. your what's your opinion about Roosevelt and his plan in working? Well, it was terrific. It's the only thing that could have worked, and, and we're gonna if we keep going like we are, we're gonna get right back to what Roosevelt did. We're gonna have to do something if we can draft people to go get killed. We got to draft them to get out here and reestablish our uh, ecology. Well, don't you think it's gonna be a harder job to get these young educated? people to do manual work like they did in those days? Well, it, 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 I don't think we have to make it a... <laughs> we 
can um, induce them with more money. Of course, we got thirty dollars a month, and, and twenty three of that went to our family. Mm -hmm. So we existed on seven dollars a month. The individuals in the CC camps, and uh, I don't, I don't know how we're, I don't know what we're going to have to do to induce them to do it. But I would be in favor and pay them a decent wage. The reason I asked that, I heard uh, on TV a young man that was being interviewed, and he lost his job and he couldn't find work and he had a family and two children and his wife couldn't find work and he was offered a, a job working in a cafeteria mm -hmm. for three dollars an hour mm -hmm. and he turned it down mm -hmm. he said why should i do that when i've got the education to draw yeah. 40 or 50 dollars an hour well the demand for the education isn't there for uh, you know and uh, but I thought that was the one way he could have fed his family. Well, sure. Yeah, if, he he gets, turned it if he gets hungry enough, he'll... Yeah. Of course, we came up through it when, when it, it was expanding, and we weren't used mm -hmm. to that much. No. You know? I, I, was, I, was, I worked for 10 cents an hour, mm -hmm. and my folks sold eggs for 6 cents a dozen. And as far as that's concerned, what an hourly wage is today and what you pay for a, a dozen eggs today is probably fairly comparable to what it was then. Not a lot of differences, some, mm -hmm. but probably not all it was. I think that we're going to have to redo the, the uh, High Plains area. We're pumping too much water out of the Oogle Gosh. Oh, yes. There was a plan, and I don't remember who instigated it, that to build a, a, a series of dams and a, and a big canal down the high plains from Canada, from northern Canada to the Mexican border. And it, they said, oh, that'd cost too much. They said it might cost up to a billion dollars. We throw a billion dollars away on a couple of airplanes. Mm -hmm. And this Unaga is what, down 170 some feet over what it was. Yes, all the. Uh wells out in the high plains they are having to lower them yeah the farmers wells yeah. because right. they because it's the water yes. tables drop that much mm -hmm. so it's something we're going to have to take care of this system of uh, this uh, this uh, country we've got here we shouldn't be polluting the air and we shouldn't be wasting resources mm -hmm. of course i've always uh had a funny feeling that uh, this defense thing's got completely out of hand. It used to be if you said anything about defense, they thought you were some sort of communist or something. Mm -hmm. But we're spending way too much money on defense when you've got enough to kill everybody in the world. What more do we need? Let's take some of that money and, and put it out here to redo our country. Do you Good think, train system would be great. Do you really think that we are up uh, with the uh, latest comparable to the Russia's? Well, of course, I remember in 45, the Russians were on our side, and, and uh, we were just tickled to death. They were killing the Germans over in East Germany. Now, it seems like all everything we do is targeted to hate Russia. I know their system's different than ours, but I know that, uh, oh, probably five-sixths of the world's uh, population lives under some form of uh, socialism. It's not unadulterated capitalism like we still have here in the United States. I think we're going to have to modify it some. And I expect we'll modify it some. We're going to have to uh, do the things that need to be done. You can't... Uh, we can't keep going like we are, or we're going to ruin our currency and everything else. I saw a headline in the paper this morning. No, it was a cartoon where Reagan had been warned that he would have a lot of advisors after he got in. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, he might put up with a few. <laughs> and now he's really <laughs> flooded with them. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there's 
was, uh, we, uh, I read an article a while back, kind of puts it like it is, you know. I, we have, I thought the most qualified man to be president in my lifetime was Adlai Stevenson. I thought he had more intellect than anybody that had ever run for president. What did they say? They said, we don't want an egghead. Yeah. Who wants an egghead for president? I think the man ought to be smart if he's going to be president. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do we do? We elect a popular general, or we elect a movie actor. Mm -hmm. And nothing personal. I don't have any personal no. against drinking. I'm just saying it's the American people. It's not. Uh, uh, we're not educated to the fact that uh, we don't want just figureheads up there. We need somebody up there that can lead us in cleaning up the air and the water and having a decent program for the farm people. Uh, a bushel of wheat in France sells for $13.50 a bushel. It sells here for the same thing it sold for the first crop I sold after I got home from war, $3.30. Well, the tractor I got now costs $38,000. So how long it took? It, it, I have for ten years just to pay for that tractor. So we got to get something. We got to get things straightened out, and it's going to take uh, it's going to take some strong leadership in Congress. Uh, we still elect the Congress up there. The PACs they ought to throw all those PACs out. I don't know any congressman that's worth his salt that can't go out in his own district and raise enough money to run a campaign in that district. Mm -hmm. They go to they go to a congressman up there now and they say, we got $50,000 for your campaign. He said, well, I don't need $50,000. They said, okay, we'll give it to anyone that runs against you. Well, then what's he going to do? He takes the $50,000. Then when it comes time for him to vote, they're going to say, well, hey, wait a minute, man. You know that 50000 we give you? I'm just using these figures. I don't know. But they say, they're going to say, wait a minute, we gave you this $50,000, and we want your support on this. Yes. And that's not right. It's, it, it just debases the whole system. That's right. Very bad situation. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? No, I think not. Okay. Mr. Gaines, I want to thank you for the interview. Yes, my pleasure. I think it's been good.